My name is Mike Pishvine, and I'm Chief Medical Officer of Prothera. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about precision medicine for patients with gastric and gastroesophageal cancers. And I will say that before I dive into this, a lot of times we will lump uh, gastric and gastroesophageal, jun gastroesophageal junctional and esophageal cancers all together. So I'll often kind of interchangeably use gastroesophageal and upper GI and gastric cancers all together. Um, except in the cases where it is specific for one certain kind of cancer. So moving on to the talk, I wanted to um, give an outline of what we're going to be talking about, which is a brief overview of Prothera and what, what our role is in um, precision medicine and what we do as a company. Talk a little bit about back, uh, the background of advanced gastric and gastroesophageal cancers, and then talk about what the benefits of um, molecular profiling could be for patients um, with different types of cancers. So moving briefly for what Prothera does, Prothera is a precision medicine company that is dedicated to try and help patients get as broad a molecular understanding of their tumors in the hopes of being able to identify specific therapies that would be uh, useful for treating their cancers. The Prothera process, as, I, as you see in the slide here, is really designed for us to be engaged with the patients as well as their treating oncologist to help facilitate getting a new biopsy that would be tested to do as broad a profile as we can conceivably do um, and be able to um, handle. Although we will, we're not doing the testing ourselves, we're coordinating the testing on behalf of the patient and the oncologist. And then when we get the data back, get the molecular testing results back, we will then um, put that in molecular data through a, um, an expert system as well as run it by a, a human medical review panel that consists of uh, board certified disease specific experts in the appropriate kind of cancer. In this case, a GI oncologist with experience in translational research in gastroesophageal cancers. And then ultimately generate a report that lists out some specific treatment options for patients and their oncologists to consider for treatment for the, uh, the advanced cancer. As a company, we're also following the patients um, after we've resent them the Prothera report so that we can learn who we've helped and how we've helped them and what recommendations and what treatment options were better than others so that over time, we'll actually continue to refine what we've learned and refine our recommendations and our treatment options that we've presented for patients um, that we come into contact with. The report um, looks like this. It's meant to be fairly straightforward um, for the oncologist to review. We do also have a patient report that's being built as well. But the report really lists out the highlighted molecular findings as well as the specific treatment options for the patient and the oncologist to consider um, for treatment. So let me talk about the context of this discussion, which has to do with gastric and gastroesophageal cancers. <clears throat> which is, uh, unfortunately, a relatively common diagnosis. There's about 43,000 patients a year that in the United States that are diagnosed with gastric and esophageal cancers, um, and ultimately about half of those patients, at least in 2016, are ultimately dying of their disease. Worldwide, it's actually even more of a problem, where there's nearly a million cases of, um, of gastric and gastroesophageal cancers uh, across the world. It's more frequent in males and certainly is more common in certain parts of the world, most notably in East Asia, South America, and Eastern Europe. And in the United States, patients who come from, who are of minority status, such as African Americans and Hispanics and Native Americans, are much, much more predisposed to developing gastric and gastroesophageal cancers. There are risk factors that we know about for gastroesophageal cancer. Um, certainly, nutritional status can affect any GI cancers, and, and, GI, and upper GI cancers are no exception. There are some environmental factors, but it's really not um, to, the, uh, to the degree that um, some of the other kinds of cancers, such as smokers and lung cancer, is. But we do know that patients um, who lack refrigeration, who have smoked and salted foods, they're at greater risk of developing uh, upper GI cancers as well. Surprisingly, things like previous gastric surgery, and uh, chronic atrophic gastritis can actually lead to or uh, increase the risk for upper GI cancers. And then finally, there are genetic syndromes, as you see listed here, that can lead to development, um, uh, an inherited predisposition to developing gastric cancer. 
What we're going to be talking today uh, about today is really uh, the gastric and gastroesophageal adenocarcinomas, of which there's two main types, the intestinal and diffuse type. But there are another, a number of other cancer types that can occur in the stomach and the esophagus, as you see listed here, but those won't be the focus of the discussion today. Um, when we talk about the staging of gastric cancer, today we're really talking about advanced and mostly metastatic patients. Um, but we do also do talk about the depth of invasion of the tumor into the wall of the stomach and the degree of lymph node involvement nearby in the gas and in, in, nearby to the stomach and nearby to the GE junction in the esophagus. And that can definitely determine stage. And stage is critically important in uh, determining the prognosis of patients um, and how they're going to do uh, ultimately. We see the more deeply involved the tumor is, the more lymph nodes are involved, um, the, the higher the stage of the cancer. And of course, any cancer. Um, of the any upper GI cancer that has spread to another part of the body, we consider as stage four or metastatic disease. And this is a gives you a picture of what the staging outcomes are like. Obviously, patients with higher stage cancers do worse, but you also see that there's a significant uh, uh, geographic variation where stage for stage, um, East Asian patients, particularly Japanese patients, not only have a higher uh, tendency to be diagnosed at an earlier stage, they also tend to have a better outcome even within any given stage. And those are reasons that we don't fully understand. For patients with uh, upper GI cancers, uh, still today, the, really, the only um, curative therapy is surgery. Surgery can include uh, things like endoscopical, endoscopic mucosal resections for very, very early stage cancers. But the point is that cutting the tumor out really is the only way that we know to ultimately be able to cure patients. And the overall five-year survival across the board, across the different types of cancers, is about 50% for patients who undergo surgery of some kind. Um, we know that adjuvant therapy, which means post-operative or neoadjuvant, which means preoperative therapy, those can actually increase the cure rate. But when patients develop advanced disease, unfortunately, right now, we still don't know how to cure those patients. And the treatments rely primarily uh, on chemotherapy to try and help um, improve survival and improve quality of life. When patients are initially diagnosed, they receive chemotherapy, and we call that first-line therapy, basically the first line of therapy they receive for their advanced metastatic disease. <clears throat> and there really is no true, true standard regimen. I think many of us who are GI oncologists will often reach for regimens like Folfox, which is 5-FU, and oxaloplatin or, or a similar regimen of 5 fu and cisplatin. But really, there has been uh, very few large phase three studies that have defined standards of care. And we'll kind of go through a couple of examples in, in a second. We also have this ongoing debate about should we be using two or three drugs for patients with uh, newly diagnosed uh, metastatic stage four gastric and gastroesophageal uh, cancers. Many of the earlier um, trials looked at three drug regimens, such as the DCF regimen and the ECF regimen that you see listed above, but there has been some recent data that perhaps adding the third drug really doesn't necessarily improve the survival, but it does definitely lead to uh, an increase in side effects, and that's an important thing that we need to weigh out. Today, to date, there are still, um, we're still really at about eight to 10 months for the overall survival for patients with metastatic upper GI cancers, although in many instances we've been able to improve that um, in different subgroups of patients. The one example um, of the subgroup of patients are the roughly 20% of patients who have HER2 positive um, upper GI cancers. So HER2 is a protein that is expressed on certain kinds of cancers. It was most uh, famously uh, identified for breast cancer because it is a big part of the treatment for patients with breast cancer. But we are starting to realize that this HER2 protein can be overexpressed or over um, uh, present in abundance in a variety of different kinds of cancers. And about 20% of upper GI cancers have an abundance of this HER2 protein. And this HER2 protein is probably driving, at least to some degree, the growth of the cancer cell. And so by blocking it, you can actually suppress the growth of the cancer cells. So a drug called trastuzumab, which again was originally a breast cancer drug, was tested for HER2 positive um, uh, upper GI cancer patients in uh, a trial called the TOGA trial. In this trial, all patients received chemotherapy, 
The chemotherapy consisted of a drug called 5-FU or its oral cousin, capecitabine, and then uh, they were also offered cisplatin. And half of the patients, roughly, were able to receive trastuzumab, the HER2-targeting therapy. And as you can see from those two lines, those two curves there, the patient survival rate for patients who received the trastuzumab when they had the HER2 protein in their tumor, they actually tended to do better. Their survival rates were greater and not shown here. Their responses and their overall outcomes were better. So we know that for HER2 positive patients, adding uh, trastuzumab certainly is a standard part of the armamentarium, especially for frontline um, or first line treated patients. The second line setting actually has been a, 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 an area of significant growth and change and, and new trials that have really taught us a lot just in the last couple of years. And there's been several trials that have shown benefit of, a of several new drugs, um, of several drugs in this setting. So there's a, a drug called ramacirumab, which is a drug that targets the growth of new blood vessels in cancers that was shown to be better than placebo in patients receiving second line therapy. There was a, a, a chemotherapy drug called docetaxel, which has been around for a long time, um, which again also showed benefit for patients in the second line setting. And then interestingly, the combination of the ramacirumab and a cousin of docetaxel called paclitaxel um, was actually shown to be better than just paclitaxel alone. And actually, I think in many cases, these, this combination of ramacirumab and paclitaxel is the standard for many people who treat upper GI cancers. Another drug, irinotecan, is also um, uh, proven to have benefit for patients in the second line setting for upper GI cancers. But what we're really here to talk about today is the genetic and, and protein and variability and the molecular profile for patients with upper GI cancers. And there are two different ways of looking at a patient's cancer. One is to look at a whole broad set of genes, not so much for identifying specific targets, but to just look and see, is that cancer different from another types of cancers? And this falls under the category of trying to subtype different, uh, different kinds of cancers. And we certainly have been able to subtype gastric and gastroesophageal cancers. These subtypes can actually show us that they, they, it is a very heterogeneous set of diseases, the upper GI cancers, that of course can depend upon where the cancer started, what the uh, cancer looks like under the microscope, and again, these different uh, genetic, uh, genetic classifications or genetic subtypes. And these uh, classifications can lead to um, an understanding of different clinical outcomes as well as response to specific therapies. So let me show you exactly what we know of. Um, there are four genetic uh, uh, subtypes or genomic subtypes that are known. And these have been looked at through different studies and there have been slight variations from study to study. But generally speaking, this has been the uh, subclassification for patients with upper GI cancers. In about half the patients, they represent what's called the genomically unstable um, um, uh, subtype of upper GI cancers. These patients actually have a high expression of these um, receptor tyrosine kinases such as HER2, and they, present, they represent patients who might have a higher tendency to have um, so-called actionable or targetable therapies for their disease. There's the MSI high patients. These are the patients who have, have had a significant improvement in outcome recently because of they, they are most likely to benefit from the immunotherapy drugs. Um, the genomically stable drugs, unfortunately, probably have the worst outcome. Uh, genomically stable patients probably have the worst outcome, in part because there doesn't seem to be therapies, uh, neither chemotherapy nor targeted therapies, that work particularly well in this small subgroup of patients. And then finally, what we've recently found out is there's uh, a sm smaller subgroup of patients that have uh, characteristics consistent with infection with a, a, a virus called Epstein-Barr virus. And those patients also have, those patient tumors also have a high rate of immune infiltration, suggesting that perhaps the immune therapies would work particularly well in those subtypes of upper GI cancers. But it's something that we're not, uh, that has not yet been fully tested and certainly worth further exploration. I wanted to talk a little bit about immunotherapy because while we do a lot of molecular profiling, immunotherapy also plays a huge role in the promise of treatment for patients with upper GI cancers. And there have been um, some important studies that have shown us that the immune system clearly has a role in fighting some patients um, with some types of cancers. This is a, a presentation, a paper from 
a, a, a melanoma review, but the general concept is that in the cancer cell, there are characteristics that allow the immune system to recognize the cancer cell as being something that's foreign, something that's not actually supposed to be in the body, in the same way that a bacteria or a virus is foreign to the normal person. And the immune system has the capacity to recognize and actually attack and fight off these abnormal looking cells. But unfortunately, cancer cells often become very smart very early, and they learn to avoid immune detection. They learn to avoid the immune system. And one of these key pathways, one of these key um, uh, molecular mechanisms for avoiding the immune system has to do with this program death uh, receptor and program death ligand, which is so-called PD-1 and PDL one that I'm sure everybody has heard about recently. And so if the tumor has this PDL one protein on its surface, it will trigger to the, um, to the immune cell to say, don't attack me, I'm not foreign, I'm part of you, and let me be. And in that way, the immune system will basically leave it alone. And we have learned, particularly from melanoma, but through a, different, a variety of other kinds of cancers, we have learned that targeting and blocking this system will actually help, rec help the immune system recognize the cancer cells and help to attack them robustly. So there is some promise in um, upper GI cancers that attacking the immune system or, or really activating the immune system um, can be significantly of significant benefit. There's a drug called pembrolizumab. The trade name is called Keytruda. Um, it was recently made famous because Jimmy Carter, ex-president Carter, is on it for his melanoma. Well, we also know that it, that it can help about 22% of patients with upper GI cancers. And these were patients with very aggressive active disease. Similarly, another drug called nivolumab, um, the trade name is Opdivo. These patients also have um, responses to therapy with the immunotherapy. And this is just one drug, for the most part, really very well tolerated. And the graphs that I'm showing you there show, of course, the progression-free and overall survival. But more importantly, what I'm trying to show here is that when patients benefit, and it certainly isn't everybody, but when patients benefit, they often have a durable benefit that can last for months or in some cases, even years. But the problem is that, you know, we're still only talking about 20 or so percentage of patients who can benefit from these immunotherapies. And so the other 80% of patients are still gonna continue to need other treatment options as their cancer progresses. So what can we do for those patients? And that's really where we hope that uh, a service like Prothera and any, and any molecular profiling service in general can help us learn more about upper GI cancers to be able to treat patients better. So the concept of doing clinical trials really is based on what we call empiric therapy. And we treat patients as oncologists empirically. We do, uh, our gold standard is to do these large randomized phase three trials where we're testing drug A or combination A versus combination B, and we're trying to see which one is better. And in, in patients with more advanced disease, if we see about a 30% response rate, that's actually a very good outcome for, for most cancers. We actually see uh, where we're excited about those outcomes. The problem with that concept of empiric therapy is that when we get it, when we do a trial and we see a 30% response rate, that we can actually, um, we're treating 10 patients ultimately only to benefit three. And in most cases, we really don't know who those three are. And so we hope to be able to look for distinct, specific, patient-specific, targetable molecular driving abnormalities. And that's really where the promise of personalized medicine comes in, where we can actually um, use these predictive biomarkers, these molecular tests, to identify which patients will benefit from which therapies. So I'm going to switch gears to lung cancer as a, as a very good example of where molecular profiling can benefit patients with more advanced cancers. Um, in, many way, in many ways, lung cancer has really led this field in the last 10 or 15 years. And this, to, to understand what, where, how lung cancer, has, uh, in, lung cancer therapy has improved, we really have to look back to about 2002, where an important trial done in, um, by Dr. Schiller showed us that it really didn't matter which chemotherapy we used for lung cancer, the outcomes were all about the same. And so if you made a pie chart of 100 patients or 1,000 patients with lung cancer, basically all of them had a very similar overall survival of about eight months, which is not too dissimilar from what we're talking about for patients with upper GI cancers that are more advanced. Then in the mid-2000s, we learned that about 10% of the patients with lung cancer have these abnormalities called a, 
a mutation in a protein called EGFR. EGFR is actually a cousin of HER2. And these 10% of patients actually benefited from a drug called erlotinib very, very dramatically. And in fact, actually patients with um, EGFR mutated uh, metastatic lung cancer actually have survival rates that are 30 months or in many cases actually now with newer therapies, um, perhaps even longer than that. And so we've carved out this 10% subgroup of lung cancer patients who have a very a much better outcome, a much better survival time than the average patients with lung cancer. Then in the late 2000s, we learned that there was another subgroup of patients who had uh, abnormalities in these proteins, ALK and ROS. And these represented about 4% of patients with lung cancer. And those patients in a similar way have uh, an overall survival that's measured in years, not months. And, I, and in reality today, this is what lung cancer looks like today, where there's probably about a third of patients who have very specific, targetable, as we call actionable abnormalities in their tumor that lead to specific therapies um, that are improving outcomes compared to the average typical patient with lung cancer. So we at Prothera have had the opportunity to do something similar for patients with pancreatic cancer through what's called the Know Your Tumor Project. Um, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network is a, a, an advocacy group focused on pancreatic cancer the way that Stocan is focused on stomach cancer. And it is an organization that's decided that it, they wanted to look at the molecular level at a large group of patients to try and see if we could identify which patients would benefit from which therapies. So the Know Your Tumor process is ongoing right now, and we've actually had about 700, probably now over 800 patients with pancreatic cancer referred to us in, at, at Prothera. We've actually facilitated biopsies of nearly 400 patients, and in delivering these 300 plus reports, we've learned a lot about what we can, um, what we can offer to these patients. And I'm gonna jump to, um, in the interest of time, I know we start, got started late, let me jump to the last two slides about the Know Your Tumor Project. Here is what we use to define so-called actionability. Actionability means can we identify a therapy irrespective of the FDA approval and, and what disease it's approved for? Is there something that the literature supports a high response rate in patients who have that specific molecular abnormality, again, irrespective of the underlying cancer type? Or are there, is there good scientific uh, rationale to suggest that, that that drug might work based on the molecular abnormality? And using these definitions, We've actually identified in pancreatic cancer, which is again a very aggressive advanced stomach cancer, we've identified that about 24%, call it a quarter of the patients with pancreatic cancer have very specific, highly actionable findings, many of which are not actually currently approved, um, therapies are not actually approved for the treatment of pancreatic cancer. And so a lot of these patients are being um, referred for specific clinical trials, or in some cases, off-label use uh, for the drugs that, are, that you see listed there. So do we have the same promise of uh, actionable findings in patients with gastric and upper GI cancers? And some of these same large genetic analyses have suggested that yes, in upper GI cancers, there are subgroups of patients who have similar molecular abnormalities that we can target. So we, we talked about the HER2 uh, overexpressed patients. You can see there that about 17% uh, of the um, of the genomically unstable uh, patients can actually uh, ben uh, have an overexpression of HER2. The gene for HER2 is called ERB2, so you can look at those two synonymously, HER2 and ERB2. But then beyond HER2, there's actually a number of other molecular abnormalities, both at the protein level and the genetic level, that actually, um, if they are driving the growth of the cancer cell, we have specific therapies that can help target these patients uh, these patients' tumors. And then I'm going to talk about one cautionary tale um, for a target called MET and drugs that target CMET um, um, in a couple of slides. So <clears throat> one example that I uh, personally am very excited about, because one of my areas of, of research is in PARP inhibitors and um, uh, in, different, in patients with upper GI cancers and, and um, GI cancers in general, and this class of drug called PARP inhibitors um, seem to work best in patients who have uh, an underlying abnormality in the genes that control the repair of DNA. So when our bodies are um, exposed to chemotherapy, that chemotherapy is damaging DNA intentionally. It's damaging the DNA 
preferentially of the cancer cells as they grow and divide more rapidly than the other cancers than the other cells in our body. So there's a number of genes that control this process of DNA repair. And when they are abnormal, they actually um, predict for a greater response to patients who are also treated with PARP inhibitor-based therapy. And these PARP inhibitors, one of them is actually FDA approved. It's called Olaparib, which you see here on the slide, but there's about three or four other PARP inhibitors that are act actively in development in, in, in clinical trials. So um, a group looked at patients with upper GI cancers, gastric cancer primarily, and they asked the question, how many patients actually have um, molecular abnormalities in, these, in this DNA repair pathway? And could we use Olaparib to improve the outcomes for patients who have these underlying uh, abnormalities? And what they found is about 10% of gastric cancers have an, a mutation in a gene called ATM, which is one of the genes that controls this DNA repair pathway. And they tested, um, a, they ran a clinical trial comparing two standard chemotherapy drugs, I'm sorry, comparing a standard chemotherapy drug, Paclitaxel, um, versus um, the drug Olaparib, which is a PARP inhibitor plus Paclitaxel. And so when you see these curves here in this graph, the yellow curve represents patients who received just the Paclitaxel. And that's not too dissimilar curve to what we see for patients receiving second and third line therapy for Paclitaxel with gastric cancer by itself. So that's pretty consistent with the literature. But when patients were treated with a combination of Olaparib and Paclitaxel, they had a significant improvement in their overall survival. And in this curve, what you're seeing specifically are the patients who had low ATM levels, either through mutation or through some other suppression of the, uh, of the, of the enzyme so that DNA repair wasn't happening as well as it should in the cancer cells. So what we've been able to show here, or what this group was able to show, was that for patients who are found to have ATM mutations in their gastric cancer, if they are offered chemotherapy plus Olaparib, then they are likely to have a much greater outcome, a much greater benefit than patients just receiving uh, 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 paclitaxel or similar chemotherapy alone. Uh, another example that's showing promise but is still very early on in the testing paradigm is a group of patients whose tumors express something called the FGFR. The FGFR is a protein, again, that can be expressed in abundance in cancer cells and in some cases is driving the growth of those cancer cells. And there are a number of therapies that will target specifically the FGFR. One of the more promising drugs is an, is an antibody that's targeting this protein FGFR2, which is, is one type of the FGFR. And in six patients um, that were treated with FGFR2 um, overexpressed gastric cancer, two of them actually had shrinkage of their tumor just with this antibody by itself, and three additional patients actually had um, stabilization of their disease for a prolonged period of time. So this looks very promising, although it was six patients, it's incredibly early on to really understand whether this is something that's beneficial. There is a drug called pizopinib, which is FDA-approved. Um, for kidney cancer and also for sarcomas. But pizopinib will also target the FGFR. And in a trial looking at looking to see if pizopinib could benefit patients um, treated with chemotherapy, specifically Cape cytopenia and oxaliplatin, um, for gastric cancer patients, they actually found that while it didn't necessarily help patients more than would be uh, expected, when they looked specifically at those who had the molecular predictive marker, the FGFR2 overexpression, and six out of the seven patients actually did benefit as well. So I think this is a, an area of research that needs to be further proven, but there are um, FDA-approved drugs that might benefit patients with these abnormalities. My one cautionary tale has to do with these MET inhibitors, and it definitely tells us that sometimes we look for these predictive markers, but we're not always right. We make assumptions that certain proteins or certain mutations could actually be driving the cancer cells, but that may not always be true. Um, there was a lot of early data that looked at, at the protein MET in patients with upper GI cancers, and it looked very promising that by targeting this MET protein that we might be able to actually improve outcomes. But two large studies um, showed us that really there was no benefit. And in at least one case, that Rylomet study, patients did worse when they received the rilatumumab versus just the chemotherapy. So as we look to do a broad-based molecular profiling for patients with a variety of cancers, including stomach cancer, we have to take into consideration that we think that um, ideally we would want to be looking at fresh tissue. So there is an issue of feasibility of getting access to fresh tissue for a full molecular profiling. 
there are certainly cost issues. Is the testing being covered by insurance? Is there access to these drugs? And how can we go about getting access to these drugs, particularly off-label therapy? Um, and then there are resistance pathways that, that will develop that we have to constantly be chasing the cancer because unfortunately cancer cells can be smart as they grow. And so all of these things really do need to be taken into consideration. Um, I'll skip this slide again for the interest of time, but basically it tells us that one slide tells us that we have to look at more than just pure cost effectiveness in, in deciding whether this testing is worth it um, because sometimes the pure financial equation isn't going to pan out, but the value, which takes into account um, survival, which takes into account patient comfort and patient preference, the value of doing the testing may still be worthwhile um, for patients with, um, who, who are in need of additional treatment options. So with that in mind, um, I wanted to try and see if I could field any other questions. So there's a couple questions that are coming up. Um, and one question is, why isn't molecular profiling done for first-line therapy? I think that's a great question, and we would love to. The reality is that um, it takes a while to do any broad-based molecular testing. And as probably you all know better than I do, or as well as I do, for a patient who's recently had a diagnosis of an advanced cancer, they're very eager to get going with their treatment. And so what we will often do is we will start treatment, especially chemotherapy, and then start the molecular testing as well. And if that molecular testing leads to a therapy that can be added on to the chemotherapy that has been selected, um, then we will do that. But sometimes we keep it in our back and keep the information in our back pocket for the second line of therapy. Um, there are questions about costs that are coming up, and I think they are also very hard, appropriate questions. I think the whole field of molecular profiling is trying to learn itself, um, because in some cases the tests are um, a standard and and are approved by um, the, not, to, not necessarily the FDA, but the pathology testing ver, um, groups. So for example, HER2 testing for uh, advanced gastric cancers is an absolute standard of care, and so absolutely should be covered based on insurance. Um, but in some cases, this broad-based molecular profiling um, is covered by some insurance plans and not others, and it's something that's changing on a regular basis. Um, so we don't actually need a live tumor sample. Um, there are labs out there that are testing cells in a dish. They will take a live tumor sample. They'll put it either, um, they'll either freeze it or they'll put it in a cold media and then they'll take it to a lab and grow it in the lab and then test those growing cells with chemotherapy. I think that that whole concept of what we call ex vivo testing looks promising, but I think is in very much not ready for prime time. There was a series of ex vivo tests that were done in the 1990s and early 2000s, which really didn't pan out. There are newer methods of actually growing tumor cells outside of a patient, but in another organism, such as in a mouse or other organisms, that do look to be promising, but those are also very costly. So I would say stay tuned for those techniques, but they're not really ready for prime time yet. There are some practical questions about how to do the molecular profiling here um, that I think Kimberly Mason is answering for us as we go along. <laughs> um, but the idea would be that if there's any need to reach out for the molecular testing, then you could certainly connect through Prothera um, and we could uh, get in contact with the patient as well as with the oncologist to really talk about the benefits uh, of a testing system like this. Uh, there is one other question about the size of sample. So these are mostly needle biopsies. So they're not they're not what we call fine needle aspirates, but they are core needle biopsies, which are being done fairly routinely at any hospital um, or any you know cancer center um, on a uh, on a metastatic deposit on a tumor that has spread, or even in the case of upper GI cancers, even from an endoscopically obtained uh, sample of tissue within the within the tumor itself. We definitely believe philosophically, and this is internal to the Prothera, we believe philosophically that the most actionable tumor is the one that you're, you're testing today with a plan to treat right away. So a tumor sample that was obtained three years ago uh, and that patient has subsequently seen three or four or five different chemotherapies in the meantime, that tumor is probably fairly different than the tumor that's growing in the patient today. So we try and get, I don't want to call it a fresh tumor, but certainly a current tumor sample. 
There was a question about chemosensitivity testing versus functional profiling. That kind of gets back to that comment that I made a second ago about tumor cells being grown uh, in a dish or in, a, in an animal organism. And the chemosensitivity really means can we take this tumor uh, outside of the body, grow it somehow, test it with different chemotherapies, and use that to predict which therapies are going to benefit the patients. And unfortunately, that hasn't necessarily panned out. I think much of it is still is still sort of research and not really ready for prime time. I, I think the animal models are the ones that are showing the most promise. Um, but again, those um, unfortunately are, are take a long, long time and are very expensive. There are definitely a whole slew of developments for other gene alterations that I just, for the sake of time, couldn't get to. There's actually um, multiple targeted therapies that are being developed, and we're trying, we're learning more and more which uh, genetic and molecular abnormalities predict for response to those different targeted therapies. And there are even a lot of investigators out there that are looking to see who are those magic 22% that, that molecularly will be predictable to respond to immunotherapies. So that research is being is something that that the um, GI cancer community in general, and certainly Prothera, is watching very closely. I'm really glad for your questions, and certainly please feel free to reach out to us if there are any other specific questions um, moving in the future. Thank you all very much.